Did our Packers get overconfident or did we try to get too cutesy? Either way, it's a tough loss to take and now we need to get back on track and keep our playoff dreams alive. Let's talk all on this episode of your Packers Fan Podcast. They were warned it was a trap game. They said they were prepared for a trap game. And what do you know? It was a trap game. I'm Scott Clark from the Gaming Outsider Podcast, and I'm just heartbroken. I'm not sure why we keep winning games we shouldn't and losing ones that we should be dominating, but here we are with the end of the December streak for Matt LaFleur. And me, I'm Wayne Henderson. Glad to be back with you. And I am still 100% behind this Packers team. And on this 289th episode of the Packers Fan Podcast, we're going to you know, talk a bit about the highs and some of the lows from that loss to the Giants. Thought for sure it'd be a win, but that's how that goes. And thanks again for all of your listener feedback. We're going to be sharing that in a bit. You had some good insights to share, so stay tuned. And we'll also preview the Packers' next game. It's an NFC Central reunion as Tampa Bay comes back to Lambeau. I will definitely share my keys to a Packers victory. And uh, as Wayne mentioned, we got some highlights to talk about. Surprisingly, even though it was a loss, there was a lot of positive things to talk about. Let's start with the pass, the Packers' leaders in the Giants game. First off, Jordan Love, 25 for 39 uh, completions for 218 yards, one touchdown, one interception, and a uh, quarterback rating of 76.7. Our leading rusher was A.J. Dillon with 15 carries for 53 yards. Receiving, we got Tucker Kraft with four receptions for 64 yards. And on the defensive side of the ball, Darnell Savage had seven tackles, six of them being solo tackles. So he was on top there. Uh, definitely the passer rating was a lot lower this week for Jordan Love. Uh, he was not quite as on fire this week, but still a lot to love. Absolutely. And six solo tackles. I love to see tackling, Scott. I do. <laughs> I, I do, too. It's a beautiful too. thing. And speaking of beautiful things, A.J. Dillon's Huge catch and run on first in the first quarter. It was a 35-yard play through down kind of the left sideline. And Dylan had some great moves, proving he's more than just a power runner. And this led to a gorgeous 16-yard rushing touchdown from Jaden Reed to give the Packers the 7-0 lead. It completely fooled the Giants defense, and Reed was able to waltz his way into the end zone. And at this point, Scott, super confident. I was feeling pretty good at this point, not going to lie. I, it was a while for this score. It, 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 you know, I was so used to us scoring on that first drive in the last couple of games. And That's a crazy thing. Yeah, I know. It, uh, it felt good. But uh, this was that Dylan is just is blowing me away, man. Like, I'm, I'm so used to him just being the guy that just plows through the middle. Uh, you know, he, he caught this one and... Uh, made a juke on a defender, made him miss, and then just went up there. That was a that was a huge 35-yard play. I'm, I, uh, I I love seeing him catch the ball. And it's more of this Packers defense doing this, or Packers offense, excuse me, doing this, where they are passing to running backs and handing the ball off to receivers. It is so weird. Uh, <laughs> I know, you know, we, we've got, uh, Dan's got a comment later on talking about how vanilla the play calls are, were, but uh, this is just seems very odd to me, and I don't know if I like it. It's you know when it works, it's great. I just don't understand the uh, um, the mentality. Like I said, it's working. When so I, I can't complain, but it's just it's it's odd. Also, Dontavian Wicks had a clutch pass in the second quarter. Uh, if you remember this one, Wayne, the pass is a little high. Uh, he was kind of expecting it to come a little bit later, like into the flat. He had to twist his body and jump pretty high to grab this one, and it kept the drive alive as it was on third down. I was not, as soon as that ball was thrown, I did not think it was going to be caught. Same. Wicks just reached up there and snatched it out of the air and it kept the drive alive. It was it was fantastic. Yes, and much like Snoop Dogg in the opening theme song, a lot of Love's passes were a little bit high near the beginning of the game. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know how he was able to jump up and get that. You know who Snoop Dogg is, right? Uh, no, who's Snoop Dogg, Wayne? <laughs> Uh, spin me a yarn, Grandpa. Uh, <laughs> uh, even even Troy Aikman had something to say. There was a comment that he made that I just kind of found myself nodding. He's like, boy, Jordan Love is sure making his receivers work for those catches. And I, nothing could be more from the truth, especially compared to the last two weeks or even three weeks. 
uh, he, you know, he was on point. And this time he was making them extend, making them have to jump. Uh, really just a little short, little high on, on these multiple passes. I don't know if something's rattling him or the cold in, in the Meadowlands. or I, I don't know what's going on. But or that's not Meadowlands. That's New Jersey. What am I talking about? Same thing. Um, Whatever. Close <laughs> enough. There you go. And we did have a huge fourth down stop in the second quarter, which made me happy as well. Eric Wilson stuck the runner before the sticks and gave the Packers good field position kind of near the 50-yard line. And I was thinking, okay, that things are starting to come together. I was yeah. pretty confident that we were not going to be 0-0 close to the fourth quarter like the Raiders game. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later too. But okay. we also had we had a massive break in the third quarter too when Green Bay punted. Uh, you know, the, the ball wound, wound up hitting one of the giant players, making it a live ball. Um and Green Bay recovered on the 14-yard line. We had some great awareness by the special teams there. Unfortunately, we had to settle for a field goal. Still, it closed the gap to a single point. The Giants were still leading at 14 to 13. But man, what a! It just felt like it was a, a long completed pass instead of a punt at that point because uh, you know on, on fourth down. So that was a huge turnaround for us. And was that the punt where when it hit the Giant player, you almost couldn't tell whether or not it touched him, except for the fact that. It changed his trajectory just a little bit, and the giant player kind of flinched like he was just attacked. Otherwise, we may not have noticed. Yeah, exactly. I I didn't notice it during the play. I saw a Packer hop on the ball, and I'm like, "What, what are you doing, guys?" I, they're they're scrambling so quickly, as if it were on like inside the three yard line, mm-hmm. like they were trying to keep it from going into the ends. And I'm like, "Guys, you're on like the 14, or something like you know what I mean? Like, settle down." And then I you know <laughs> realized after the replay that it had touched a player. So. Yeah, settle. great awareness. Settle. Settle down. <laughs> oh, Tucker Crafts, 43-yard catch in the fourth. That almost warrants a chef's kiss. It was the longest play of the night up to that point, and it came right after the missed field goal. And then a three and out by the Giants. It led to another field goal attempt, and thankfully, Scott, this time Anders got it right through. We got the points, and it cut the lead by the Giants down to five points. So, you know, we, we had a touchdown. We can do this. I was feeling pretty good, and uh, especially because Carrington Valentine had a fumble recovery. Uh, recovery? Yeah, recovery. <laughs> fumble recovery. Uh, Barkley was on a huge run into the end zone, and I was pretty much like, oh, the game's over. I actually remember looking over at my wife and saying, well, it was a good season. And uh, turns out he fell. This is a crazy, crazy play. He fell, was not touched. So even though he was down, he was never touched by one of the defenders, so he was still considered a runner, and the ball came out as it hit the ground. Valentine scooped it up and ran it back 50 yards to keep the Packers in the game. This led to a six-yard touchdown pass to Malik Heath to give the Packers a lead, and this was his first touchdown pass as a rookie Packer. Uh, unfortunately, we missed the two-point conversion, so we only led by one point. Uh, shoulda, coulda, woulda. <laughs> Could have gone into overtime at the end of this game, but man... Still, we had the lead, and I was like, all right, got a minute and a half to hold them, and uh, let's let's do it. And that was not my favorite two-point conversion attempt that we've ever done. No. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Uh, a positive, before we get to the end result, there was a lot of loud go pack goes at MetLife Stadium. Pack Sparrow and fellow Packers fans let their voices be heard throughout the game. Beautiful. Yeah, it was really great to hear even even the announcers were making comments like but you can really hear the Packers fans on this one and uh, they were definitely present it was good to see so uh, Wayne we do have some low lights to talk about though unfortunately obviously the game was lost but there was a lot to to be desired here as well yes now although we did have less points than the Giants when time ran out the penalties are back <laughs> and they were crazy <laughs> pass interference on Valentine in the opening defensive drive and then there was a penalty for blindside block and the crazy personal foul against uh, Rudy Ford on the punt return. That one, I I could see it going either way, but it looked like Rudy Ford was trying to avoid the guy and the guy just, the, the punt returner for the Giants was just not looking where he was going. I, he was looking for the, he was looking for the ball. He couldn't find the ball. Well, one thing I, at I, a time. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, and, and Rudy Ford, this was this was not intentional. He was no. 
he couldn't even see the guy because the other defender who was was blocking him was in the way. And it, then he just like kind of got out of the way and parted the the Red Sea and boom, uh, that one seemed a little bit like uh, like like it, it didn't quite deserve that one. But uh, you know, that's the rules of the game. It would have been some people would have been just as angry if it had happened the other way. So okay. Also, uh, we had some sloppy defense at the start of the second quarter. Yes. Simply made it too easy for New York to tie the game. DeVito should have been sacked multiple times. I don't know how he got out of there. We couldn't stop the run, couldn't stop the pass. Uh, the, the defense was definitely very frustrating this week. Do you agree? I agree 100%. You know what else we couldn't stop? Was the <laughs> camera that? crews focusing on DeVito's parents up in the stands. We saw them like at least nine times. I mean, that's triple what we normally see of Taylor Swift at a Chiefs game. It, I was going to say it's better than Taylor Swift. I mean, it was quite a cast of characters. I don't know who the guy next to DeVito's dad in the stands was that looked straight out of 1979 New York, <laughs> at, like a mix with Father Guido Sarducci on Saturday Night Live back when that show was funny. But it was, they just kept going to that same shot. And I'm like, come on, Pac Sparrow's there. Keep that camera moving. Well, DeVito's got a, a an interesting story. I True, mean, he but was, nine uh, times. He, <laughs> yeah, he's from he's from Illinois. Actually, one of my coworkers is a massive Illinois fan, and uh, he was their quarterback last year. The guy was undrafted. Uh, right. They just picked him up as a you know for the practice squad, and uh, he he wound up being the third string quarterback and came up and has been doing great for the Giants. And you know, then they kept talking about the 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 story about how he's still living at home. You know, he's an NFL quarterback living at home. His mom's making his bed and making his dinner for him and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, the whole, I don't know how to do that for radio where they do this, you know, they, the, the Italian stereotypes, stereotypical, you know, talk with your hands kind of thing that has uh, become his MO. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fun story, but yeah, it was a little, little overkill. But, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have been bothered if it was, you know, the story yeah. was on our side of the bench. And a friend of mine at work who's originally from New York, he's kind of a Giants fan. Okay, he's a huge Giants fan. And he walked by <laughs> my desk today and did the hand thing. And I'm like, I got gotcha. you. Uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. <laughs> Giants beat us again. Oh, well. And how about this fumble by Jordan Love in the second? He was originally ruled down by contact. And I thought, all right, we're going to get away. No, he clearly fumbled. They caught it. Yeah. I don't know why he didn't just run for the sideline. He had a beautiful block. It looked wide open, at least at first. At the very least, we, we could have been happy with the 10-7 to 7 lead and a field goal at that particular point of the game, but that fumble was, that hurt. It was brutal. Like you said, he had a wide open sideline. Uh, it, it just that, that block left it wide open. I understand he the moment. You don't see it like we do. You don't see the angle that we do on TV. Um, I definitely can't <laughs> run with that ball down there, but... Uh, it would have it would have made me feel a lot better, but yeah. Uh, also, love was intercepted in the second with about four minutes left. This was the second turnover by Love in the first half. He threw into double coverage. Lafleur was really wanted a, a flag for a hold. We unfortunately didn't see that on on TV. I didn't really see what they were looking for, but thankfully we forced the Giants to a three and out. Uh, but still, it killed that momentum after a huge stop on fourth down from from uh, uh, the the previous series. Yeah, it was just one of those nights, as proved by Keyshawn Nixon, muffing a punt return. Now, he did fall on it immediately, but he made the cardinal sin of trying to get back up and keep running, fumbled it again like you do. Uh, New York finally recovered the ball, bounced back with a bunch of people on it, several players, in fact, and basically turned a fourth down huge play for the Giants. So they let it led right to a score by Barkley. I don't know. I, they had just got done talking on TV about how Barkley, man, he's being held pretty good tonight. And then all of a sudden he's running wild and gave the Giants yeah. a 14 to 10 lead. And I'm like, thanks for mentioning it, uh, Troy and Buck. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of special teams, uh, Anders Carlson uh, did miss another field goal. This was a 45 yarder, left the Giants with an eight point lead. Boy, it would have been really helpful to keep it under seven points at that point. But, uh, you know, we can't, we can't expect perfection from any player, much less a rookie and uh, right. I'm, I'm still not angry with a guy, man. No, no. He's uh, like, I, I just, you know, it, we can't expect another Mason Crosby right off the bat. And even Mason Crosby had bad seasons. Uh, I think this guy needs to need some other, some more chances. And then on the final drive of the game, it almost looked like our defense either had no gas or just gave up. 
The Giants only had about a minute and a half to go all the way down the field, and that's exactly what they did. We let them get into position for the game-winning field goal, cutting you know the clock all the way down to the final two seconds, and just and just rip our hearts out. It was just it was heartbreaking. This one hurt, but I'm not really mad at the team because you know it was just all phases was off. I mean, it would have been fine if it was just the offense that was off, but the defense, special teams on both sides of the ball. Uh, everything. In fact, that's what led to the poll question that we have every week. We post it in the Facebook group at uh, PackersCommunity.com as well as on Twitter X, where you can find us at Packers Fan Pod. Which facet of the game will be the easiest for us to turn around before next Sunday? You think our offense is the easiest to fix by then, or maybe the defense, coaching, or special teams? What say you, Scott? I- I'm going to say special teams. Because really? uh, the spe- yeah, I think I mean that's that's the biggest room for improvement this week. I think uh, you know outside of the the uh, the punt recovery, you know where where they were able to recover that when they hit the player, uh, so many other things went wrong. We missed a field goal. Uh, we muffed a punt. Uh, those kinds of things don't happen that often in a single game. So I think that's going to be the easiest thing to uh, to recover from. Um, you know because the the defense was probably the the biggest issue, especially that final drive. But that's a bigger that's a bigger ask than uh, than special teams, right? And if it wasn't for the missed field goal and some of the other stuff, that wouldn't have mattered. But mm-hmm. you know, there's certainly plenty of blame to go around. I'm going to go with coaching if I had to pick just one because there were the uh, you know the trick plays and there were too many of them. I think there were three, and they although they didn't fumble the ball on him, they were a little too obvious, and they they got stopped. I think all three behind the line of scrimmage. And so I'm going to put that on, on coaching. We, we, you know, don't get too cute. <laughs> you know, let's just try to win. But the uh, results that came in with the voting, 67% when you combine Twitter and Facebook went with offense. I'm not sure how mm-hmm. that's going to be the easiest to fix by next Sunday, but if they can, that would be a great leap forward. Defense got 4% of the votes. Coaching got 27 and special teams, believe it or not, Scott, only got 2% of the votes. Wow. That's that's unexpected. I would have, I don't know. I thought I, I had some pretty sound reason in there. You did. I liked it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we had some comments on the poll in the Packers Fan Podcast Facebook group. Uh, actually, just one from Dan Dyler. He said, it's so hard to answer these type of questions while watching from the stands, but I feel from my vantage point, it was 100% coaching. The play calling was vanilla, especially compared with the previous three to four weeks. They went to a prevent defense the last drive, which, if you've been turning into tuning into football for more than three days, is code for prevents you from winning the game. <laughs> True. I was disgusted at how soft they were playing. I was in the nosebleed seats, and we could all immediately see the problem before the ball was even snapped. Maybe Joe Barry needs a seat in the Goodyear blimp to call the defense, or better yet, needs to stay in the blimp and just go somewhere else. Oh, my. Well, Dan was there. Wow. First hand. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the feedback, guys. If you'd like to be part of our upcoming podcast episodes, you can either record your voice in your phone or computer and email the recording to feedback at PackersFanPodcast.com, or you can call the PFP voicemail at plus one nine two zero three pack go As always, the deadline for your calls is Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Hey, Wayne Scott. This is David out in Texas. Um, I think, I think Matt LaFleur should be absolutely ashamed of himself for that game. No, players didn't play very well, especially in the first half. But I think Matt LaFleur's game plan was just absolute garbage, especially in the second half. You know, didn't run the ball against a team that's 30th in, the, in rush defense, has given up over 140 yards in the past four games. And you decide to play zone read runs and – you know, don't let AJ Dillon, you know, run up the field and, and take advantage of this this run defense. And you know, in that second half, they just horrible play calling. You know, the Giants figured out the whole jet sweep end around, and you continue to go to it. And guess what? It cost you the game because if you you know, pick a play that they haven't figured out, you might score on that two point conversion. And it was just, it was just absolutely ridiculous to watch that. 
and especially in that final drive, is just poor time management. You're down by five. You're within the 20 yard line with just under two minutes to go. You need to try to milk some clock to give as little time as possible. And they didn't. They just kept trying to just score as quickly as possible. And you, you can still run the ball. Yeah. I just, I, I think Matt LaFleur deserves a lot of blame in this game. Jordan Love deserves a lot of his blame, blame in this game as well. But Matt LaFleur, especially in this game, does. So they can still make the playoffs, but, you know, this is a reminder that it's any given Sunday or Monday in this case. You gotta get, you gotta prepare and you gotta go play to win. Uh, no matter what, still a fan. Go back, go. Go Pat Go indeed. I can tell where David voted in the poll. Yeah, <laughs> Clearly it was the coaching so. for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to to disagree with him on that. I, I think there were some issues on coaching as well, especially the time management. Um, yeah, the and, and I wasn't expecting it from him because, like I said, the press conference he did last week, he was all like, no, we're going to be prepared for this game. It's not an easy win, all this, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, all right, great. We got the overconfidence issue taken care of. Um, I, I, you know, and David made a good point that they figured out our Jets sweep around. Uh, that that's that's what won the game for them, and uh, it, that's a that's a big bummer. Also, I got to give a huge shout out to uh, David. He didn't. I was ex- expecting him to mention it in his uh, in his voicemail, but congrats! They uh, he and his wife just had their first uh, child. This oh, past week, but congratulations! Just a few days ago, indeed. So. Yeah, congrats, man. Really, really happy for you. We were I actually was supposed to record a, a uh, an episode of my other podcast with them, and uh, he's like, I can't record. My wife just went into labor, so <laughs> uh, I was like, it's all right, man. Got to do what you got to do. So that's definitely an excused absence for sure. And yeah. you brought up an interesting point: the uh, post game press conferences and the press conferences during the week. I don't know about you, and I love the Packers as much as anybody. But I can't bring myself to watch hardly any of those. There's so many of them. And not only does the mainstream media ask a bunch of annoying, antagonizing, stupid questions, but Coach LaFleur and a lot of the players, they just kind of give the same rote answers. I don't really glean any new information from them. Do you? I, I don't really watch them either, Wayne. I, I just uh, read some of the highlights, or something pops up in an article mm. I read. I'm not, I don't, I don't have, it. ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. I the only reason I would watch press conferences is to get those, you know, the, those sound bites firsthand, the ones that we see, you know, like playoffs or, right, uh, you know, things like that, or or watching a Belichick co- press conference has, has got to be just hilarious because I don't that dude just. It has just just monotone, no emotion whatsoever, win or lose. He's just like, oh, yeah, whatever. 300, 300 wins. Yeah, that's great. It's on to Frisco. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, it's, I, it's just all about the next game. He's all business. I do have a couple of exceptions, though, especially if I hear that they did something uh, crazy. Jair Alexander, and then, of course, uh, when we used to have Jamal Williams, and sometimes, like last year, Jamal Williams with the – when he was with the Lions and the guy asked him about playing Pokemon, he's like, it's not Pokemon, it's Pokemon. <laughs> he's like, got to go. <laughs> so those two guys, characters I like to watch. But to, That reminds so, me, I still owe you 10 levels in Pokemon Go. Yes. I got I to I gotta do that before the year is up. Maybe we can do that at the same time as our uh, Madden. Because you, there you saw go. the mock-up of Madden 25, the cover has just a yellow flag on it from the officials. <laughs> I do have it down installed on my phone. Oh, I, I actually okay. installed it like like right after the season, and I just keep forgetting. I'm not doing it intentionally. I just uh, I don't play many games on my phone, so uh, except for Duolingo. <laughs> so and that's not really a game as much as it is a learning tool. So I, it's just not a thing I think about when I open up my phone. But I will get on it. I promise you. I think you said to level ten, right? Is what I owe you. Yeah, depending on what level you're already on. If you're already on level nine, then we'll make some adjustments, but I got a secret that helps out. Yeah. You got to catch them all. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Is that it? Win or lose. I'm green and gold. Tom dead and cold. This is Megan. I have to call. It's 1028. I'm trying to give like this, like raw, real raw reaction to the game per request of Dan Dyler, who's at the game in New York right now which is really awesome. I looked for you on TV for the first like minute, but then I got distracted. 
so I don't think I saw you, but I hope we had a great time. Obviously, we did not come away with a W. That was like, I mean, yeah. I don't know if I have a lot of words for that. A little bit more of a brutal offense, but, you know, you can't win them all. But we'll win them next week. We got Tampa. Yeah, I don't really know. I have, like, it's, like, super hard. I'm sure you all understand as, like, if we've won the last, like, what, three, four, five, six, seven, eight games. Like, we've won a lot of games. We've been doing really well in the last, like, three weeks. And then t- this is, like, a little bit of a, like, really against the Giants? Really? But I felt that way about the Broncos, too. And I'm like, really? But, you know, it's just a game. Did we have to win out to win the playoffs? Hopefully not. I don't think we did. We still have some season left. I mean, I really, like, thought we could pull it out. But, like, I just, I don't know. I'll leave it to, like, the others to give the critical analysis. Maintain my rose-colored glasses and say, go pack, go, and green and gold till I'm dead and cold. I did think at the beginning of the game, like, the first drive was kind of like, mm, I don't know. So I was like, oh, my gosh, like, it's my fault. I had to I, I didn't have my jersey on, so I put my jersey on and, like, nothing changed. <laughs> but whatever. I love the podcast. I love the Packers. Green and gold time, dead and cold, baby. Let's go. Bring on Tampa. Let's go. Hi, this is Megan. I'm listening to the post-game press conferences right now, and I just have some last-minute thoughts. I don't think it necessarily is a benefit to anyone at all, ever, to, like, just make Jordan Love feel like crap. I kind of feel like that's what they're doing when they're talking to him. And he does, like, this, like, every so often awkward, like, kind of chuckles and, like, scratches the back of his head because he feels, like, nervous. But I just am, like, what's the point of that? Like, what's the actual point of just making him feel like he did a really bad job? Like, obviously, he didn't perform to the level that we all know he's very capable of, which is why we're holding him to this standard, because we know that he is extremely capable of it. But, like, is it going to make him feel better about it if we just make him feel like crap? Probably not. I love his confidence and his willingness to just say, like, well, we'll we'll come back next week, we'll come back next week, because it all starts there. And it starts there, and it starts with him starting there as the leader of the team. So I trust Jordan Love. I know I'm like, maybe not necessarily. I think I'm in good company with Scott and Wayne, but even if I wasn't, I don't care. I still trust him. I think that he's, he has great potential and, you know, like he's no Zach Wilson. So let's just be grateful. Very grateful indeed, Megan. Thank you so much for sending that in. And yeah, I'm totally behind Jordan Love. He's the guy I know I saw some comments even in our Facebook group dissing uh, Jordan Love. It, you know, it was one game. I mean, you know, there were some at the early part of the season, but uh, lately things have been on fire, and then we took a step backward. Now it's time to take some steps forward. So, I, yeah, Jordan Love for the win. And, yeah, Megan agrees. There's not a lot of words to really sum up this game because it's just what it is. And I don't think, Megan, that we need to win out to make the playoffs. We're – Right there, just still on the bubble, tied with <laughs> like four other teams for the... We got some help from the Rams, and we got some help from the Seahawks. Did not get some help from the Vikings, unfortunately. We, it, well, yeah, it, a lot of teams did not help us out. Now, as far as winning the division, that we would probably need to win out and then have the Lions crash and burn a bit, but it, it could happen. Anything, Anything's possible. Uh, and And I know, Wayne, that we hate it, when they do this on TV, but there was that comparison they showed between Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers, you know, at this point in, you know, the first however many games of the season. And those numbers were shockingly similar, shockingly similar, like number of wins, number of passing yards, no, you know, whatever it was like, he's doing just as well as Aaron Rodgers did. And even Joe Buck, you know, kind of covered himself. So we're not saying he's the next Aaron Rodgers, but 
<laughs> numbers don't lie. Media, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, they love to do and, crazy and, stuff. And and the fact that everybody is still just that upset with him, he's got just as many wins as Aaron Rodgers had. You know, at this point in, in his rookie career, not rookie career, but his first uh, career season with the Packers. I as mean, a starter, yeah. We, we've been so freaking spoiled, Wayne. We've had we've had three decades of top tier quarterbacks, just two of them, <laughs> just two of them. Yeah. They both hung around for quite a while. And, and we're, we're just so expectant of anybody that comes in there. I don't like the pressure on Jordan love. And I don't like, I'm, I'm with Megan, the way that they, I don't watch this press conference. And that's part of it is I, I don't like the, you know, the deep dig questions and stuff that make a player that they, they feel awful already. You know what I mean? He, he he's got to feel terrible. He, he probably blames himself for the game. Uh, even though he's only partially to blame, um, you know, I, I I don't like that. I don't like that on any player, uh, but especially not my Green Bay Packers. And in about eight years, when they do the side by side and all the numbers match up, except for maybe Jordan Love has three Super Bowl wins, we'll talk. We'll address it then. That's for sure. And I am surprised, go. Megan. Things did not turn around when you did get the Packers jersey on. That that it, it must have helped. <laughs> Just didn't get the win, but have it ready for when Tampa Bay comes to town next week. Let's uh, see who else sent us a message to feedback at PackersFanPodcast.com. Go, 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 Pack, go! <sighs> Giants, what's up with this team? Last year, London, this year here in New York City. Come on, Giants, why you got to keep busting our chops? <laughs> Not a fan of it. Uh, but then again, what happened during the game? Uh, it looked like Lafleur forgot what's been going on the last month when we've had success. I can't remember seeing one deep ball that was be uh, uh, in the air for over 15 yards. And I know Watson was out, but that's, Reed's fast, even though I know he went out with a concussion, but that wasn't later till, done until later in the game. And uh, Wicks, our other speedster, he actually hurt his ankle. Um, it looked like from where I was sitting, uh, but man, just so many missed opportunities, and I know in a missed field goal, uh, but still they they didn't cap off uh, the the drives like they should have. Um, but it's all good. Uh, currently on an eleven hour road trip, that <laughs> it feels a lot longer today because of uh, how last night went down. But still had a blast this week here in New York with my buddies. Uh, found a great uh, Packer bar in New Jersey of all places. Um, and then uh, the New York Giants fans were great, so gracious. Um, we ended up finding a tailgate, um, gave them some cash, and we got to eat as much and drink as much as we wanted to. And like, they even had like a DJ. They had like a buffet spread um, with like six or seven different meats out. It was just a fantastic job time. Uh, got to give a shout out to that. That was a big blue barbecue. It was the name of the of the uh, tailgate we went to. And like I said, the, the, they were very gracious hosts and uh, not what I expected from New York. Anyways, time for, uh, time to hit the road and look forward to hearing the feedback um, from all our listeners and from you guys, Wayne and Scott. Keep up the great work. Go, 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 pack, go! Go, pack, go indeed, Dan. Oh, a little jealous you got to go to that game, even though don't really like to go to games where they lose. But uh, I, I still love seeing all stadiums that I can go visit. But, uh, man, that's dedication. 11 hours each yeah. way to go to a game. Um, I, man, I that that is a long, long drive, man. But, uh, yeah, the Giants have our number for sure. Uh, I agree with the passing. Um, I mean, on one hand, they're listening to us, right? They stop throwing the deep ball, and then they stop throwing the deep ball, and we're complaining about throwing the deep ball. But there just weren't very many at all. Uh, I don't know the, if the Giants secondary was just that good. It's really hard to tell from, you know, from the angle that we get on TV. But uh, glad to hear that the Giants fans brought the brought the hospitality. You know, I, I love hearing stories like that. That it's not Green Green Bay that uh, that welcomes opposing fans. Uh, that's really cool. So Dan, thanks so much for the voicemail. I think a lot of people are extra welcoming when they see Pac Sparrow as well. How can you not be? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. You see him, right? you're like. I recognize you. <laughs> he on. did. He d- he did text me and ask me for the uh, for the QR code. So nice. I did send him a QR code. So he's got it on his phone. So hopefully 
you know, he ran into some other Packers, uh, Packers listeners out there in, in New Jersey that maybe you're hearing this episode for the first time. That would be cool. Welcome. You're amongst friends. And yeah, Dan, <laughs> spread that around anywhere and everywhere that you like. And yeah, those 11 hour road trips uh, back home, he did t- stop to take a break, you know, like a rest stop or something and to record his message to send in to us. So thank you, Dan. That <laughs> breaks up the drive and helps out a lot. Absolutely. Thanks so much, man. We also got an email from Jared Machini Kerr. He says, if the offense plays more than one quarter of good football, they win. If they don't lose the turnover battle, they win. If special teams didn't play badly, they win. If the defense played better, they win. If Joe Barry stops lining the secondary up 10 yards down the field, they <laughs> win. If if Joe Barry, if the Joe Barry led defense stops allowing 200 yard rushing games, they win. Fire Joe Barry on to next week. Go pack go. <laughs> I'm sensing a theme. <laughs> Jared, Colorado, great to hear from you. Thanks, thanks for that email. Good stuff. As always, your calls, emails, comments, and support are so much a part of the Packers Fan Podcast. Thank you. Remember, you too can be a part of the Packers Fan Podcast Facebook community and be part of the conversation at PackersCommunity.com. Check all the action out and join in, especially for our live game chat section. There's some good stuff that happens in there. Now, let's clear that off and look towards the future, Scott, because your 6-7 and seven Green Bay Packers are back at Lambeau Field hosting the 6-7 and seven Tampa Bay Buccaneers Sunday, September 17th at high noon central. The Packers lead this series 34 to 23 and one tie. And it all started in the NFC Central against the Expansion Bucks on October 23rd, 1977. At Tampa, our Packers won 13 to 0. I would have expected a much bigger victory against an expansion team, but the 70s, and they weren't full of too many Packers highlights. So I'll take the win. And one of the funnest games between the Packers and the Buccaneers to watch highlights of is, of course, the Snow Bowl from December 1st, 1985. It was unbelievable how much snow was falling in Tampa Bay, Florida that day. Wait, checks notes. Uh, the game was actually at Lambeau Field. That that makes more sense when you think of the snow. Sorry for the confusion. It was future Hall of Famer Steve Young's second ever game in the NFL after coming over from the USFL. Not his or the Bucks' best day. Packers shut him down 21-0. to zero. And the most shocking thing about this game at Lambeau Field was that Lambeau Field was only 30% full. Only 19,856 people were in attendance. There were over 36,000 no-shows, the most in Packers history. And it's nuts. I would like to say, because, you know, the 80s, not the greatest decade for the Packers football, but there was Packers football. But I think that no matter how much snow Lambeau Field might even get in the future, I, I can't imagine any scenario where Lambeau would ever be below even 75% full. Absolutely not. There's yeah. no way. There could be three feet of snow on the ground and people would still figure out a way to get there. They'd be tailgating. Uh, you know, they'd be they'd be shoveling the stands. Like, <laughs> like there's there's no way. Can you believe that? Only 30% full at Lambeau Field? Crazy. I mean, it's not even like that on, you know, practice. We're talking about practice. Yeah. And, of course, remember all of the great head-to-head battles between Brett Favre and Warren Sapp back in the day? That's some amazing stuff. Oh, that was so cool. The, just the friendship between those dudes. I, I used to love and the headbutting watching. Yeah. I, I used to love watching Brett Favre get up for after getting sacked by Warren Sapp, running up to Warren Sapp and headbutting him with a big smile on his face. Like, dude, that was a hell of a hit. I just, <laughs> oh, I miss, I miss 90s Packers football so much. Uh, I actually went to a Packers Bucks game myself at Lambeau Field with my wife and my brother back on November 20th, 2011. This was my brother's first ever trip to Lambeau Field, and the Packers treated him to a 35 to 26 victory. So I have very good memories of that game for sure. Excellent. Now, this coming Sunday, the weather at La 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 Lambeau is going to be just partly sunny, 40 degrees at kickoff. That's about four and a half degrees Celsius. So definitely football weather, not another snow game. I would I kind of I'm kind of in the mood for snow football, man. I haven't, haven't had that in a while, but. Uh, well, I got some keys to a Packers victory over the Buccaneers. Wayne, are you ready, sir? I am ready because we got to turn this around, and I think we can do it with your help. I know. I keep flip-flopping on this one, but my first strategy is going to be to stick to the pass game. I've sounded like a huge hypocrite these past few weeks since I was so in with the idea of the Packers being a running team. 
Granted, A.J. Dillon has proven that he's much more than a power rusher who carries defenders on his back. He's got some quality moves, but this week should be about the run. They've only rushed for 10 or more yards on 4.9% of the 265 carries this season, which is the second worst in the NFL. Conversely, the Buccaneers defense has allowed 10 or more yards on only 7.7 of rush plays against them, which is the fifth best in the NFL. So even if Aaron Jones makes a comeback this week, I think it's time to rely more on the arm of Jordan Love and his young receiving core. They've built up a lot of trust, and if Love can make it a little easier for his receivers to get their hands on the ball, it should be a much better ride this time around. Strategy number two, uh, don't let third down scare you. Believe it or not, Wayne, believe it or not, the Packers have a third down conversion rate of 27.1% when they have 10 or more yards to go, mm. which is the ninth best in the NFL. On the flip side, the Bucks have allowed 25% of third downs over 10 yards, which is the worst in the, in the, in the uh, entire league. While I'll never truly be okay with being in third down, this is right. a prime time to capitalize on the lopsided advantage. And for the love of all that is holy, please don't run the ball on third and long. <laughs> Strategy number three, expect a heavy running game. Baker Mayfield may have made some clutch plays, but this will be a running game, I believe. In fact, the Bucs have not won a game this year, have not won a game this year where they ran the ball less than 25 times. Unfortunately, this is where the Packers are traditionally weaker, especially after the poor tackling of last night's game. Tampa Bay is much stronger on their right side as well, where the Packers are usually weaker. So it might be time to make some adjustments to compensate for that. Excellent. Have I have it. I've been taking notes. I'm ready to watch this unfold Sunday afternoon. Thank you so very much, Scott, for the keys to victory. I, I think mm -hmm. those are excellent. And you brought up an interesting point. Let's not forget, we don't have Aaron Jones. Christian Watson was also out this week. And mm -hmm. Jair Alexander's still out. I don't know what's going on with, with uh, Aaron Jones or Jair, but if we can get at least two of those three back, I expect big mm -hmm. things. Yes, sir. Moving on to our 2023 season wager of fun. Last week's predictions, uh, we both predicted the Packers to win, so the differential does not matter. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think every every play every uh, listener also picked Green Bay to win the game. So right, nobody got any points this week, man. Nobody at all. And uh, I got to uh, apologize because I apparently made an error on last week's uh, Packers fan podcast listener scores. But before we get to that. That means, Wayne, I'm still leading six to three. Oh, you didn't make a mistake with six. that, I see. Okay. Didn't make no, didn't make a mistake with that. But but here's the the running for uh, for the listeners. We have in first place a three way tie yep. between David Newman, Dan Dyler, and Jay Walters with three wins each. So it's coming down to the wire for those guys. And in second place, Brett Connor has one win. So it is still up in the air for him as well. Yeah, there's plenty of games left. Uh, Brett Connor could get on a roll. Like, I believe it uh, started out with uh, David Newman, kind of the hot streak at the beginning of the season. And then Dan Dyler came on and tied him up. And now Jay Walters has been on a roll till this week when nobody picked the Giants, thankfully, uh, to win. I <laughs> I worry that within a week or two, if I don't start turning things around, you're going to clinch. I know. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Uh, as for this week, I really hemmed and hawed, man. I really went back and forth uh, about whether to pick the Packers to win or whether to pick Tampa Bay to win. Scott. But uh, I, I wound up uh, deciding <laughs> that this one's at home. Packers play much better at home, especially in December. Uh, so I'm going to say Green Bay wins 27 to 24. All right. Me too. I say the Packers are going to win 24 to 20. And so far, as of the time of this recording, I think we're all still in shock from last night's game, we don't have any listener picks yet for the game, but the uh, post is there in the Facebook group, so feel free to add your uh, scores anytime before kickoff. The sooner the better, just for fun. The NFC North, well, it didn't all go our way. The Lions are 9-4. and four. The Vikings won 3-0. to zero. <laughs> They should be ashamed of themselves and not even accept that victory. The Vikings are 7-6. to six. We're 6-7. Six and seven. And the Bears somehow beat the Lions. Five and eight now are the Bears. They were looking pretty good too. Justin Fields has uh, stepped it up that game, and I was well, uh, I was all happy for it. it. Felt weird cheering for the Bears though. That's that, that is very weird. I was just rooting against the Lions. But what's interesting <laughs> is I think much like a couple years ago when we broke the Cardinals and they were never the same since. I think we broke the Lions. 
And maybe so. maybe even the Chiefs. Maybe, yeah. Although, did you see that? Man, at the, all anybody's talking about on on, on uh, Twitter and uh, TikTok is that Chiefs game, which I didn't watch, but I didn't feel like I needed to because like, I've seen that play so many times. Travis Kelsey threw like an amazing lateral pass that, uh, you know, went in for the score. And, uh, but they called it back because it, they were off sides. I'm like, guys, you were off sides. I don't know. It was, it was, it was crazy because the week before Patrick Mahomes was in the press conference saying, oh, yeah, we let him play, blah, blah, blah. This week they didn't let him play and he had a problem with it. So, <laughs> yep. I mean, he had the same argument in both, in both cases. So, uh, um, the guy was uh, uh, lined up off sides. Not as egregious as I've seen some players, but it, it was pretty off sides. Not only that, but there was another player a little north of him, about four or five players north of him that was actually uh, lined up illegally as well. There's a NFL rule that your, your shoulders have to be square against the goal line. And he was kind of, he was kind of tweaked to the side a little bit. So oh. there was actually should have been two penalties, but. And I know that is a rule, but I think how and where you line up, as long as you're not past the ball, I, I think you can do whatever you want, but. That's yeah, why I don't he was make clearly the rules. Past the ball. <laughs> and those other NFC North games, I alluded to them, but they they were just ugly. The Vikes and, and at the Raiders, no scoring till the final two minutes, and, and the stinking Vikes get the win with a field goal right at the end. And I'm thinking mostly, how did this horrific Raiders team beat us a couple months ago? It, it boggles know. the mind, and how the mighty Lions have fallen. I think we did run them on. Uh, on Thanksgiving, and the Bears won that disaster of a game as well. So we'll have to see how the rest of the season shakes out. Anything can happen. I mean, just, well, anything except for maybe the Panthers getting any more victories. But other than that. <laughs> well, moving on, Wayne, I want to remind everybody about my other podcast, The Gaming Outsider. We release a new episode every week, and this week is no different. Tomorrow, we are releasing the latest, and it's just Zach and I. We're recapping everything we saw at the Game Awards this year and a lot of things that disappointed us overall with the presentation. You can hear my show at the same place as you listen to this one, and you can find our website at thegamingoutsider.com. And if you want to be creeped out by a television episode, well, this week's Doctor Who episode, The Giggle, was... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. The, the Giggle was effectively disturbing especially in the first uh, 20 minutes or so i was like this is gonna freak some kids out if they're watching this thing and it's on disney plus so it's kind of aimed that direction anyways we talk about it all on the don't blink podcast at don't blink podcast.com thanks so much for giving back to your package fan podcast via patreon we really appreciate it Details for becoming a patron and other ways to support the PFP are at PackersFanPodcast.com forward slash give back. Jay Walters, AR12 level patronage. Go Pack Go and thank you. Dan Dyler, thank you and Go Pack Go for supporting the PFP at the Jordan Love level. We really do appreciate it. We've got some fabulous Brett Favre level patron supporters as well. Go Pack Goes and thank yous to Miguel Ramirez at the Opposites Attract podcast. Call him Nolan in Ireland, Megan and Scott Boers. And Curly Lambeau, he's inspired some Patreon support as well. Thank you, and Go Pack Goes, as we welcome Brett Connor to the Lambeau Leapers. Welcome. Hey. And also Joe Christensen and Hank Davis from the TPE Network. Thank you so very much. Check out all the details at PackersFanPodcast.com slash give back. As a reminder, we are the unofficial Packers Fan Podcast, not yet affiliated with the NFL or the Green Bay Packers themselves but we would love to be. Please tell your friends about the Packers Fan Podcast. Thank you for all that you guys do. And follow us on Twitter or the random letter X at Packers Fan Pod. Follow Scott over there. He is Go Cast Scott. Follow me over there. I'm at Wayne Henderson. And now here's community members Joe Christensen, Megan, and Dan Dyler with their Go Pack Goes to carry us all the way back to Lambeau Field because Tampa Bay is coming and we got to win. Go Pack Go! Go Pack Go!